Thanks for joining us today at City Life. We believe today's message will empower you and point you towards Jesus. But remember that church is so much more than a message you listen to. It's a living, breathing community that we invite you to be a part of. We hope to see you on a Sunday morning at City Life, in person or online. jump right in. I'm going to say some things and we'll see if you relate. Coffee, tomatoes, hummus. Some who I can't tell if that's a ooh, yum or ew. Okay. Brussels sprouts, dates. Okay, there we go. Oh, you guys love those things. What is the commonality with all of those things? Oh, look at you. <laughs> Exactly! Those are all things I used to hate, but I now love. Isn't that true? I was going to put things in there like beer, but I actually do love beer, but I don't drink it. Because at one time in my life, I loved it too much. (laughs) But how many of us, how many of you have something you now love that you used to hate when you first tried it? You know, there's, we all have that thing Or those things that we just hated so much. But why all of a sudden do we love them now? Well, it wasn't all of a sudden. It was a habit. Because the more we do something, the more we want to do it, the more we start to love it. Generally speaking. Of course, there are things that that doesn't work. We just discipline ourselves and we do it. Like follow a budget. According to my husband, I capitulate, but I cooperate, I think. (laughs) Do you know what? We are formed. Everyone say, I am formed by my habits. And sometimes this is good. Things like Brussels sprouts are good for you. Hummus is good for you. Dates are really good for you. And just to qualify, I'm talking about the little bitty things you eat, not like going out on dates. But (laughs) tomatoes are good for you. Those are great things to develop habits. Beer and wine, probably not so much. But habits shape us. We are formed by our habits. And if you're with us for the first time or maybe tuning in for the first time, we started a series last week called Overflow. Overflow, how stewardship shapes a bigger life. Now, this series is actually twofold. It's a series about money, but it's also a series about habits. And the two actually go together, whether they're intentional habits or not intentional habits. And if there is one place in life we would do well to develop good habits, everyone say good habits, to develop good habits, it's about money. We don't just want to let the habits form on their own because We are broken human beings. I don't care how much you love a budget, how much you love numbers. When we're not intentional with money habits that expand beyond just budgets and making sure we're not overspending, which is what we're going to get into a bit more today. But there's intentional habits that we want to form because when we form those habits, they actually bring increase to our life. They give, they create opportunities that weren't there before. And especially as Jesus followers, man, as Jesus followers, the way we handle money needs to be different than people who do not follow Jesus. It's a good question to even ask yourself. If you've got friends and maybe family who, who don't consider themselves a follower of Christ, are your, are your money habits different than theirs? Something should be different about our money habits if we're followers of Jesus. Now, as we get into some scriptures, I want to start off with the good news. Here's the good news. Everyone say good news. Now, to clarify, God is not against you and I having money, wealth, and possessions. There was a wrong, a good thing, to amen. That is actually really good because you know what? There was a time in church history where that false teaching 
was very strong. God wants you to be just enough. Actually, that's absolutely not true. God doesn't want to just take care of our needs. If all we are concerned about is that we have enough that our needs are met, that is as, that is as much heresy as I can just do whatever I want with my money. Because as a follower of Christ, we're called, to, we're blessed to be a blessing. Everyone say that, I'm blessed to be a blessing. Deuteronomy 8.18, this is part of God's covenant, which was a very important promise that he made not only with his people, but it also extends now to us if you're a follower of Christ. He said, remember, this is Moses speaking about God, and he's reminding the Israelites of all of the promises that God had given them. In De Deuteronomy 8, he said, remember that the Lord your God gives you the power to gain wealth. Isn't that cool? God wants to give you wisdom. He wants to give you creative ideas. He wants to give you strategy. He wants to give you discipline. He wants to give you the power to create wealth. Now, there's a so that attached to it. In order to confirm his covenant that he swore to your ancestors as it is today. Why does God want to give you the power to get wealth? So that our lives are a reflection of who he is, a generous, abundant God. And God is an abundant God. God is a generous God. We see that right in simple things like creation. There is no need for something like color. It serves really not much functional purpose. But it's great. It's beautiful. God could have given us a little tiny pill and said, this is your food. It's going to sustain you. All your energy is in this one nice little pill. But instead, he gives stuff like meat <laughs> and barbecue <laughs> and vegetables like Brussels sprouts. <laughs> Brussels sprouts and bacon. You have not had Brussels sprouts. If you hate Brussels sprouts, come hit me up afterwards. I will give you the ultimate lover. It will turn you into a lover of Brussels sprouts because it involves bacon. God gives you the power to gain wealth in order to confirm his covenant. In 1 Chronicles 29, David is declaring this. It's in a prayer. It's in a prayer, actually a song of praise to God and worship. He says, riches and honor come from you, God. You are the ruler of everything. God is the one that gives wealth and riches. However, here's the thing, and Mike mentioned it earlier. Money more than any other aspect of life has the potential to form us in not so great ways. And this is why when we start looking at something like the Gospels, which are the story of Jesus, God in the flesh, his time here on earth, Jesus had all sorts of red flags about money and wealth and possessions. He wasn't against it. God did not change his mind. Jesus, God in the flesh. We won't get into how that works, but he is God in the flesh. When God showed up on the planet, he did not change his mind about money, wealth, and possessions. But Jesus had some red flags. And we're going to read through these quick because I want us to just get it, get it all together. Mark 4.19, Jesus is preaching. He says, all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of this life, the lure of wealth, and the desire for other things, so no fruit is produced. Mark 10, 24, how hard it is for those who put faith in wealth to come into the kingdom of God. Matthew 6, 19, do not store up riches for yourselves here on earth where moths and rust destroy and robbers break in and steal. Matthew 6, 21, for where your wealth is, there will your heart be. Matthew 19, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, there's a lot of speculation about that. Here's a simple thing. Jesus was making a pun. It doesn't make sense in English. It was hilarious in Aramaic slash Hebrew. I can't say it. But you just got to know, why is he talking about a camel and an eye of a needle? In Hebrew, those words are very similar, and it's a pun. 
So Jesus was funny. He was making a funny thing about money. Luke 6, 24. Be, uh, but unhappy are you who have wealth. Now, another translation gives a bigger meaning. But it says, but unhappy are you who have wealth in this life only. For you have been comforted now. Luke 12, 15. Then he told them, watch out and be on guard against all greed. Because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. Luke 12, 20. But God said to him, this is a story that Jesus is telling. This is the last part of it. God said to him, you fool. This very night, you will have to give up your life. Then you will get all the things you've kept for yourself. And Jesus concluded, this is how it is with those who pile up riches for themselves, but are not rich in God's sight. Luke 16, 11. If you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? Here's just, this is just completely side one. This is a freebie. If you ever feel stuck when it comes to the riches of heaven, if you ever feel stuck spiritually, you know one of the first places to take a look is, God, how am I been spending? How have I been managing? How have I been handling my money? So why all the red flags? Well, here's the thing. Money, wealth, possessions, riches, whatever kind of terminology and all of the things they are connected to, they have a way of quickly growing out of control and taking over our lives. They quickly become a controlling and out of control force in our lives. How many of you remember Veggie Tales? How many of you remember Veggie Tales and the rumor weed? Remember the rumor weed? Oh, look at it. It starts out as a cute little weed only to grow into this massive, controlling, out of control monster weed that was trying to destroy Mr. Alfred. Veggie Tales. Now you're going to want to watch. The innocent little thing grew into an ugly weed. This is actually, well, this is about a rumor weed. But Jesus actually told a story about a wealth weed. And it's a story, the parable and the sower and the soil. And he talked about how a man went out and he sowed seed into various kinds of soil. Some fell across the path. Some was, you know, fell on the hard ground. Some fell, you know, in places in the, amongst the weeds. And the seed that fell in the weeds, it said the weeds grew up, the plant grew, but the weeds grew up and choked the life out of that little seed, out of that plant. And Jesus described the weeds, and we read this verse at the beginning. The weeds are the worries of this life and the lure of wealth. See, money itself is neutral. It is not good or evil. It is neutral. But there is a very real spiritual power that in our very nice, smart, scientific, give it to me, logically age of Western North America, we don't talk a lot about spiritual forces. But just because we don't talk about them doesn't mean they're real. But there's a very real spiritual force that works in our culture that works a lot globally now. And Jesus referred to it as mammon. Mammon is a spiritual force. Is it a demon? Probably not a demon. It's more like something worse. Because it's a whole way of thinking. It's a system. It's an attitude. It's a powerful force that is much bigger than some puny little demon. It is a spiritual force that takes, mammon is a spiritual force that takes money and utilizes it and turns it into something like a, a weapon of mass destruction in our soul. The only competitor for affection that Jesus mentioned is the mammon. And so, with all of that said, we want to become intentional with our practices, hey? Hey? We want to become intentional with our habits that relate to money. So finances, money, well, things don't get out of control and become a huge weed that choke out life. 
But more than that, we want to get be intentional with our, our money habits so that we actually can create, we can create something of opportunity. We can, God wants to use finance and money to change the world. Hello, it costs money for something like an organization called A21, which is one of the missions organizations that we partner with, which is an anti-human trafficking organization, which is spreading out all over the globe. There were people rescued again just this week. Every single week, there are people that are being rescued, getting free out of human trafficking and getting a new start in life. Not only in places like Asia and Africa, in our own backyard. But things like that take finance. And see, God wants to util- God can utilize finance in a way that can change the world and can create opportunities that are actually an eternal return on investment for us. As much as Jesus set red flags out about money, man, there are so many others about reward. God is a God that rewards. You can't take it with you, somebody said, but you can sure send it on ahead. And that is absolutely true. What we invest in in this side of eternity can transfer into becoming an eternal payoff, a reward. Well, won't we all be equal in heaven? No. There's nothing about equality in heaven. Some of you are just like, what? Socialist in you is like, Here's other, this is another side one. Here's the problem with socialism. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. It is a right desire from a wrong motive. It wants the kingdom without the king. It wants the benefits of the kingdom without submission to the king as the ruler of all. That's another sermon for another day. But here, if we learn to hold our money, our stuff, not just our money, our stuff in the right way, man, it can bring increase. So here's some practices to keep the weeds in check. Are we ready to go? Practices to keep the weeds in check. Number one, Mike talked about this last week, tithing and giving. If you weren't here, I encourage you, watch the video, listen online, whatever it, it is. And if you were here and you're listening and you're like, it went fushoo, went in here and round out the other, we'll just bring it up again. Here we go. I love this statement. This is by a scholar and theologian, Leslie Newbigin. He said, we do not give 10%. Because that is what belongs to the Lord, we give that portion to remind us that all we have is the Lord's. Isn't that great? If you were unfamiliar with the concept of tithing, tithing is simply giving 10% of our income. God says it's actually mine, and I'm going to give it, I'm going to use this as a test between you and me. We're going to see, do you test me? Will you test me? Do you trust me? See, in 1 Corinthians 10, 26, Paul is quoting from Psalm 24, and Paul says, he says, the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. Everything we have, everything we own, all of your income from investments, from your salary, from your dollar an hour job, from whatever you get from grandma who loves to bless you on your birthday, it is all God's. That includes your kids. Parents, we're called to steward our children. They're not ours. We steward them according to God's purpose. You don't have to give a tithe of your children. (laughs) Actually, you don't. They talked about that. It's like, bring a goat instead. But we don't want your goats either. Thank you. Here we go. Giving. I love it. Here's one. Pastor John Tyson from New York. He says this. He said, giving is central to your spiritual formation. Giving is not God's way of raising money. Giving is God's way of raising people into the image of his son. Isn't that powerful? Giving is not God's way of raising money. Giving is God's way 
of raising people into the image of his son. Why is that? Well, it's because God's character and nature is that of giver. Everything about him, it, he gives. Everything about God is generosity. So tithing and giving are practices. One are practices that we engage in, we're intentional about, that keep the weeds from growing. And this is one I wanna, this next one is one I wanna get a little bit more into today. Simplicity. Everyone say simplicity. Simplicity. This is a spiritual practice, it's not just an aesthetic of life. Simplicity is a practice. In other words, when you first start doing it, you're probably going to get it wrong. It'll probably feel awkward. It'll probably feel this is not right. This is like whatever. But it's, it's a practice. And this is, what the, this is what simplicity is. It's the practice of discipline in how we acquire, consume, and possess things. It's the discipline of how we acquire, consume, and possess things. It's about keeping our possessions, including money, in a proper perspective. So, simplicity is not minimalism. For some people, it might look like that. Simplicity is definitely not poverty. It's not, I have just enough for my needs. And the thing about simplicity, it will look different for different people based on your age, based on your stage in life, based on a lot of factors, based on the stewardship of your life. It will look differently. But what simplicity does is simplicity confronts our need to seek or consume things as, not as blessings from God, but as a life-giving thing in and of themselves. I'll say that again, simplicity confronts our need to seek or consume things, not as blessings from God, but as life-giving in and of themselves. In other words, we're looking to the things to bring something into our life, to make us feel secure, to make us feel confident, to make us feel like we're doing better than our parents, to make us feel like I want to give my kids something I didn't have. And so often we're not aware of how we are acquiring, how we are consuming, how we are possessing. And that's why we need to take time and we need to, need to develop habits that challenge the desires that we have inside so they don't grow out of control and turn from a cute little seedling into an ugly weed that is choking us out. So. Here we go. Here's some questions to get us thinking. You ready to roll? Some of you are like, oh, man, my kids need to hear this. Some of you parents, are, your kids are like, mom and dad need to hear this. <laughs> I love my parents, but, man, they had a lot of stuff. <laughs> here's some questions. Here's the one. Are you an impulse buyer? Are you an impulse buyer? This is not nudge your partner, nudge your spouse, nudge your kid. This is, are you an impulse buyer? Do you online browse when you're bored? Is the Amazon guy a frequent visitor to your house? Does he know you by name? How many trips to Costco do you make a week? How many times are you at the mall in a week? Here's, the, here's some other one. What value cues are you being influenced by? It's 50% off. It's such a great deal. It's all over TikTok. Where, here's another one. This is an important one. Where, where am I maybe being influenced by a scarcity mindset? Oh, it's the last one. There's three left on the shelf. I better take all of them. Hello, toilet paper days from 2020. No shame, no shame. Here's, here's another one. When making purchases, do you factor the true cost of an item? Do you think about how much it's going to continue to cost to service it, to upkeep? to clean, maintain, repair, insure, finance? 
How much time will this thing actually cost me? Like, if we buy this thing, am I actually saying no to something of greater value? I'm buying this cool toy, but are we going to have to go in debt to do something like have a good vacation with the family that's actually life-giving and investing for the future? Will it add value to my life and enable me to enjoy God and his world more, or will it be a distraction? And we're all going, Ugh. I ask these questions to myself all, all the time. I just say all the time, all, frequently, because this is something, it's a practice. And these practices are meant to be, these questions are meant to be part of the practice. And we just got to flat out start asking ourselves questions. Like if we just start out with evaluating it, acknowledging, yeah, I'm way too influenced by a scarcity mindset. I'm way too influenced by TikTok value cues or whatever it is. What about this one? What around my home or bedroom, if you don't own an own home or your room or your space, what around your home could you do without? Is there a whole bunch of stuff that you don't even use that somebody else could actually be blessed by? See, the goal of simplicity is developing the habit of seeking God's kingdom first. And the promise that Jesus said in Matthew 6, where he invites us to seek first the kingdom of God and God's rightness, God's right way of being and doing life. And all these other things will be added to you. Jesus wasn't saying, just seek God and forget about everything else. Don't want anything else. Don't acquire anything else. Don't get anything else. He said, you got to seek God first with all your stuff, with all of our finance, with all of our possessions, in order to be able to put those things in the rightful place so that what God really wants to bless us with, we've got room for it. It's about loosening our attachment to acquiring, possessing, and consuming. And to focus on what really matters. And we live in a consuming Western culture. We consume. We consume wherever we go. And to get out of the habits of consuming, we need to practice because it's not just going to happen naturally. So here's what I'm inviting us to do. As a church, I'm inviting, this is something every single one of us in this room, and actually even you watching online, you can be a part of. This week on Wednesday, who knows what starts? Lent. Now some of you are like, what? I grew up in that practice and I don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> You know what Lent is? Lent is a practice that has been part of the church world since the third century. That's a long time ago. And it's actually been, it's a time, it's 40 days leading up to Easter. And the whole purpose in Lent was, believe it or not, it was a practice, a spiritual practice, the early church put into place in order to remove distractions so that people would be more present and more aware of God in a season. And it was a way to prepare for Easter so that when Easter comes, and this is the thing we don't get in the West about Easter. Christmas is big in, East, in the West for holidays in the church. But originally, Easter was the biggest holiday. And you still see this. If you go over to Greece, man, Easter is off the charts. It blows Christmas out of the water. It is not, it's nothing like it. I mean, they get, real, they, get, they get a real goat. And they kill it, and they put it on a spit, and it goes around on the thing on the open fire. Everybody does this. They go to the, and they have party. Like, it's like you go to your village, and you party. You dance, and you eat food on Easter. It is a huge party. I can't help but think, man, I wonder if their ability to really party and enjoy Easter has to do with all the preparation they do 40 days beforehand. And see, it's, Lent is about preparing our heart to encounter God in a fresh way in Easter. Not just show up on a Sunday and we go through our Easter routine and we kind of go and we do our eggs and our whatever it is. But God, man, what could God do in your life, in your family's life? And so Easter 
is a powerful time of celebration. Lent, typically, people use Lent, I'm, I'm, fa- I'm giving up cigarettes, I'm giving up coffee, I'm giving up chocolate. Lent is usually seen as a fasting food something. But it's actually a twofold thing. It is a go without. It is a fasting practice. It's going without something, doing without something, in order to be more present and more aware of God. But it's also, Lent is also doing something new and different. It's a don't do and it's a do. Everyone say don't do and do. It's a don't do and do. Not one or the other. Well, I just want to go on the doing part. Let's do the do. No, it's like it's don't do and do. It's about don't do the normal routines that are maybe distractive and do something new. Do a new practice that would engage and maybe build spiritual muscle in you in a way that could create a whole new experience. It's about developing new habits that form us more into the image of Jesus Christ. So here's some practical. These are just some things. These are also in the app, I think. Um, But here's some practical. This is one way that we can practice simplicity as a form of fasting. Now, this isn't just the only way. There might be something else that you're wanting to give up. Maybe simplicity for you is you are going to clear out all of your screen distractions, video games, Netflix, the likes, whatever it is. Maybe that is a distraction for you. But here's simplicity, the form of fasting. How could you curb spending over the next 40 days? Where maybe it will involve staying away from things and spaces that are make you want to buy. Maybe it involves staying away from the mall for the next 40 days or only purchasing groceries and gas or what is absolutely needed. And no, the 12th pair of shoes are not a necessity. Maybe it's deleting the shopping apps from your phone. Maybe it's considering and going through your house or your bedroom and looking at what could you give away, not junk. This isn't just to take out the garbage. What could you actually give away that is kind of like, oh, I don't know if I can give away. Man, there's something freeing when you do that. Maybe it's developing a spiritual practice. This has been my practice for the last couple years. It's the in and out. If something comes in, especially to my closet, something goes out. And a lot of times it's like, oh, there's a lot of things I still want to keep, but it goes out. Other activities, things that you could do less of or eliminate. But here we go. What are some practices that you could engage in over the next several weeks to create a new habit, a new spiritual muscle? And we've got two that we're making available for you. Starting this Wednesday, everyone say Wednesday morning, 6.30 a.m. We're going to do devotion again, our 6.30 devotion time. We did this last year as a, tri- it was, I was just like, wow, this is exciting. So, sorry, not Wednesday, it's going to be on Thursdays this year. Thursday, not Wednesday, Thursday. Everyone say Thursday. Thursday mornings. Lent starts on Wednesday, but Thursday mornings, 6.30 to 7. And for all you night owls, Saturday nights from 7 till 8. A great opportunity where we're going to just, we're going to come together we're going to have worship music on. It won't be live, but there'll be worship music playing. It'll be a quiet time. We're basically wanting to create space to seek God together. Quietly in God's presence is for teens and adults. Please don't bring your children. We need a quiet. It's a quiet time to really spend time in God's presence. You can bring your kids if they can sit through and not make noise. But then we'll take some time maybe reading or sharing from the Bible and praying together really believing for God to do something in us as a church. But here's another practice. I really want to, I want to encourage, I'm going to tag off of what Mike talked about last week with regards to tithing. You know, if you aren't currently in the habit of tithing, or maybe you're kind of an in and out habit or you're trying to get started, why not take Lent? as a time to engage in this practice. This is one of those do practices. And see just what might happen financially in your life. Here's the thing, Malachi 3.10. What would happen if you would use this time and see, put into practice the way and let 
in what God invites us to do. He said, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, it's God's house, that there may be food in my house. And look at these words. Test me in this, says the Lord God Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. How does that work? I don't know. I know it from personal experience and seeing it work in the lives of so many people over and over. God invites us to test him. And if you need a little bit of a switch in your thinking, instead of thinking about, oh my gosh, how am I gonna live on 10% live on less? Just flip it. How will I live on 90% of my income? Sounds a lot better. But there's something about this practice that God recognizes how deep our hearts are connected. I want us to stand. Can we stand how deep our hearts are connected to the stuff of this world, the weeds that grow, the lure, And so could we just do this? Can we put our heart, hand on our hearts? And just say, God, would you help me in this? Just quietly talk to him about the specific thing he has been speaking to you about through the service. makes your heart beat really fast, makes you nervous, makes you fearful, makes you anxious, makes you mad. And God, we need your grace. God, it is only your grace, your supernatural divine enabling that gives us the power to do what we cannot do in our own human strength. God, Philippians, God, Paul, he said that, God, you create in us the desire and the will to do what pleases you. And so, God, would we, and you know what, if you'd be so bold, is even just pray that prayer, just say, God, would you create in me the desire and the will to do what pleases you, what honors you, God? We want to be, Father, not just individuals honoring you. We want to be a church that honors you. And so, God, would you show us, God, show us as your people, God, how we can live disentangled, God, from the, the things of this world that so quickly and easily become weeds that choke out the life of your word, the life of your promises. And God, would you open up our hearts and our minds to see those weeds. God, we pray that even over this, this Lent season, these six weeks, these 40 days of, Father, being able to be, be preparing ourselves to encounter you. God, we desire you. God, we desire you more than anything else. And God, I know so, I believe so strongly, God, there is so much more that you're wanting to reveal to us, to reveal to people about who you are. And God, we desire to know you more. And so God, would you show us the stuff and the way the stuff is getting in and becoming a distraction. God, thank you that we can trust you. Thank you. And you know what, just with every eye closed, this next prayer that we're going to pray, I really think for some here, this is going to be a start, a new start for you and Jesus. Some of you are called. Some of you in this room, some of you watching online, you are called to be a great capacity, a great big, I want to say wellspring, that kind of sounds dorky. But God just wants to get a lot of money to and through you. But you don't know Jesus yet. You don't know Jesus yet. And see, the increase of our life isn't stuff and things and money. The greatest increase is the life of Jesus Christ. It's knowing that what God created us to be, the creation mandate in Genesis 1, 26, 27, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Your purpose in life is to be a reflection of who God is. Salvation is not about a sin remedy. Salvation is about being restored to your purpose, and that's to be a, an image of God reflector. 
We can't do that with all the junk, not just sin, but with all the mixed up ideas and stuff about who we are. But God wants to restore his image in you and through you. And church, can we pray? If you want to say yes to Jesus, yes to following Jesus, yes to receiving the life, his life he gives to us by his spirit living in us. Can we pray this prayer together? Everyone in room and online as well. Just say, Jesus, thank you for your salvation. I say yes to this gift. I receive you now. Thank you for a brand new start today, in Jesus' name, amen. We hope today's message encouraged you. If you want to take your next step in saying yes to Jesus, you can always contact us at cty.lc slash next step or fill out the next step section on the City Life app. It's an honor to play a small part in what God is doing in your life. We look forward to connecting with you soon.